Yes. Ah. No registration step. All right, I'm turning it all into the shredder after class, and then it's going to be the luck of the draw for all of you. Sound good? It's more exciting that way. Does anybody not have the review list for the test? Not give it to you guys? No. Do you want it? Yes. Are you sure? Are you sure? By the way, I went out of the way to cut this very cool. See that? See that? Kind of creative, aren't I? AKA, I found the scissors in this. I would argue that kind of creative. Make a play so quick! Yeah! Did you see that? Yeah. That was that was good. Do it again? No, we can't do it Oh, catch it? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that, that's where you wanted it. Okay, on T on Teams, I always post what we're doing for the day and a link to everything. So I'm gonna ask you to watch something over the next few days. It's a thing I got from this. This is why I do occasion. I accidentally get the wrong class. And I get first period, and it looks exactly the same. And that's when sometimes I get I'm halfway through class and I realize, oh, I've been recording to nobody in fourth period. Okay, let's go up here. So for today, it's a video clip I made from, okay, there's this documentary called New York that PBS did in like 12 series. It's really good. Obviously, it's far too detailed for New York City for us. But they have a fantastic excerpt about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. It does such a good job. And so I cut it out and cut out that section and put it on YouTube. American Experience, or this great PBS series, they did a full hour on that. And it's available on PBS if you want to know more about it. it it's, it's really well done. But I wanted something that was good, relatively short that you can watch. So please watch it, click. Let me know if somehow YouTube scrubs it because technically we're violating a few copyright issues. Keep your mouth shut. But uh, just watch 24 minutes. I'm not going to assign anything from this directly, but this will be, there will be a, a short ID on the test of all this. Yes. Sound good for everybody? I think you really like it. They do a great job. And it's 24 minutes. It's well done. And really think about what caused it from unions to the practices on the work uh, uh, on on the uh, in the sweatshop on the work floor and also and what happened the result but also what came out of this what came out I think you really like it it's one of those it's, it's just perfect for 24 minutes so that that'd be a quick little thing to watch on YouTube if all of a sudden it's scrub, drop me a line, I'll load it on, on um, Google Drive and get it to you. But it's, I think it should be fun. You never know how you do this. All right, so, McKinley Talk about Wild War. Can we harness the power of the balloon? Moving on. So, who shot McKinley? A Boston anarchist by yeah. the name of Leon Franks. <laughs> Josh. Josh. There we go. And I'm butchering it too. Uh, it's a, a Slavic name. He was from the Balkans, an American naturalized citizen and immigrant. And by the way, no, it did not trigger revolution. And it would hurt labor unions because it was another one. See, they're a bunch of radicals. Don't trust them. And what was the amendment that said the uh, Cuba is going to be a protectorate? The U.S. can do anything they want in Cuba instead of Guantanamo Bay. Wow. Yeah, that's the Platt Amendment. And where was the horrific insurrection? Filipino. Yeah, Filipino. Who's the leader of the Filipino insurrection? Emilio Aguinaldo. Aguinaldo. Yeah. And who would be the who? Who would the person Roosevelt would send down to be president and? And wrote a water buffalo, water buffalo, but also got stuck in the bathtub. That's another story. He was pretty big. You know, stuff happens. And so we got here. 
So, so everyone knows Teddy Roosevelt's president, right? I did not put down the slide. Teddy Roosevelt's president, and he, he people people called him Teddy or TR. He liked Theodore, but that's the way it goes. And TR, his cousin, who greatly admired him, would copy the initial thing. FDR, and then FDR was um, such a powerful and important president, you'd have a, a couple other Democrats follow him. JFK, LBJ, Hubert Horatio Humphrey did too, H cubed. Okay, so with that, his foreign policy would be dubbed the big stick. So all you need to write the big stick, but his, he, it's kind of a bastardized slogan from West Africa called speak softly and carry a big stick and you will go far. Implying use diplomacy if necessary, but if they don't do what you want, and that's the key element, it's still, you gotta do what I want. The big stick is the growing US Navy, which is more modern. And every ship has infantry called Marines. And they're going to be greatly expanded to what they are now during this time. And so big stick. And with gunboats, this will be known all around the world as this kind of diplomacy, as gunboat diplomacy. You're not doing what we like? We'll park a big ship off your shore and intimidate you. The main was a little bit like that. And I should have, if you look at this picture, I mean, look at that. First off. Look how big TR is. He's a giant. Not only that, look at these ships, but what's the scariest thing? Those birds. Yeah, look at those pelicans. They could scoop up a city, an island in their beak. They're so sharp. I hope we use the, the pelicans for good. By the way, has anyone ever been really close to a pelican and seen? They are the most prehistoric dinosaur looking things. You know, you can definitely tell. Birds are like flying dinosaurs. I mean, they are flying dinosaurs. What's your favorite dinosaur of all time? It's huh? Well, it's a bird. I, I, I'm a partridge, so it has to be a bird. Birds are dinosaurs, right? I'm Jay Partridge. My parents were had a obviously had a sense of humor. I'm two birds. No, my middle name is. No, it's not pigeon or something. Robin. <laughs> Thank goodness it's not Robin. It's Three birds would have been too much. Yeah. Two or two is the perfect yeah. amount. Jay Finch Partridge. Okay, so with that. But this is economic imperialism. Economic imperialism. So this is the bigger country coming in and dominating the economy, dominating the resources. So that could be agricultural or mining resources and sucking it out of these smaller countries. But let's be clear about it. They're still technically independent, but they darn well better do what we want. And so here you can really see it on there. One of the biggie, debt collection. You owe money to U.S. banks, we're going to come get you. In ninth, well, there was an event that happened in Venezuela. We're not going to talk about it here, about debt collection. So I'm going to skip this or jump right here. So you got to write down the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And remember, the Monroe Doctrine was no European intervention in the Western Hemisphere. It had been basically forgotten into the Spanish-American War. But now Roosevelt gave a speech where he uh, Corollary just means an addition. This is not law. It just says this is how the president is going to do foreign policy. So in italics, when you're done writing down the Roosevelt Corollary, go ahead and read it and see what it says. This is actually pretty amazing. This is not a law. This is not some kind of agreement made with other countries. This is, this, this is telling other countries this is what we're going to do. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Yeah, probably how they learned it to make it sound like they're reluctant to do this. Like, yeah. you know, we're being forced to do this. Or they're in the right. That's a really good point. We don't want to do it, but we have no choice. So implying that we had no choice but to be the police power. And where are we going to be the police power at? Where? Our it's our hemisphere. It's our hemisphere. 
And what will we do if we find chronic wrongdoing? Intervention means send in the Marines. Or threaten to, you do what we want, or we send in the Marines. Now we're implying to stop wrongdoing and that kind of thing. But let's be clear, who decides the wrongdoing? Us for the judge, jury, and execution. Not quite. It's not us. It's whom? What person? And that's what we got to get down. But Roosevelt is saying, I, like I said, Roosevelt, I will decide. I will decide for the United States. And then future presidents would be like, oh, I like that power. I'm going to keep it. Does that make sense? And you get a lot of people who will run against it, like Woodrow Wilson. And then, I kind of like it, though. There's very few presidents who would give up that power. The closest would be uh, his cousin, FDR. Mm -hmm. But that says the U.S. will intervene whenever they want. And so here it's showing, this is implying, here's America protecting Latin America from the big bad bullies of Europe. But it's kind of the other way around. And no, the United States is not always bad. Sometimes the United States will do good things, but sometimes they do bad things. And the important thing to understand is, what are people going to remember? Maybe in the U.S., okay, they might not know either, but in other places, they'll know when the U.S. came in and said, nope, we don't like your government because we want your copper industry. And so, I add this. The Platt Amendment came a year earlier. Remember that? The Platt Amendment is an example of this. This would be like a testing ground because what is the key element of the Platt Amendment? Intervene anytime we want. I see by saying we, I'm talking about kind of generic United States, but it's the president. And these aren't declarations of war. Congress is basically just kind of going, okay, whatever, we're gonna let you do whatever you want. Congress has the power to declare war, but they're, they don't want anything to do with it. Congress is like, you do what you want, because we want no political fight. If it works in the short run, we want to take credit for it. If it doesn't work, we can blame you for it. We're not gonna take any responsibility. I wish I could say Congress now isn't like that now. That's pretty much all it is. It kind of ir it, it should irritate us all. So this is what we got to get. The Dominican Republic would be a classic example. This little country on the island of Hispaniola. Uh, back then it was called Santo Domingo. So you can see it in this little cartoon right here. And but then it just Dominican Republic, 1904. So year up to the Platt Amendment, a Caribbean island. Uh, sugar plantations, but there's also mining there. You know, steel production is becoming important, so they need a lot of alloys. Well, the Dominican Republic had borrowed money to buy, and they literally had two bad sugar years. So they went default. What does default mean? They couldn't make a payment. They couldn't make a payment on their bonds. Most of the bonds were owned by big American banks in New York City. I know how to click something into the mouse, aren't you? Thank you, thank you. That was sincere. But, so the banks, here's the deal. The banks made a pretty risky loan. They loaned money to the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic has kind of a shaky financial system, but it's a relatively weak government, it's a poor country. They made a risky loan. If you're in business, you make a risky business deal. You lose, if it doesn't work out, what happens? You lost. That's the whole idea of business. That's laissez-faire. What do you think the banks thought about this? No way, we want our money. And so they went to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt saw this as, how dare the Dominican Republic not pay back their debts? Now let's be clear about it. People don't pay back their debts all the time. Banks or other creditors all the time have got to make agreements with people. You, you, you pay less. I'll cut it back so you still pay back some. Or there's something, a legal thing called bankruptcy, which especially the very wealthy take advantage of all the time. But not here. The U.S. sent in the Marines. They took over to the Dominican government. Took it over. Took over their tax collection. So these are tax collections on mostly Dominican peasants who have virtually nothing. They took it over, and what do they do? 
55% of the revenues of the Dominican Republic go to the creditors. Who are the creditors? The banks. And so this is not, this is not like it goes to the United States. So uh, at least you know, like Americans can say, well, we're getting money. No, this is going to banks. So maybe their shareholders get money, but this is going to banks. So they made risky loans at high interest and got it all back. So what did this encourage banks to do down the road? This became the new business model. Go in there, get as many, buy as many bonds and encourage as much debt, as debt as possible because they know if a Latin American country doesn't pay it back, in come the Marines. Just imagine if you had a business and you could make every risky move you wanted. You make all these just crazy moves that you could lose or you could gain big. But here there's no losing. If it doesn't work, you make a phone call and here comes the army to get your money back for you. By the way, there's a name for this called moral hazard. Meaning you can do whatever you want. There's no threat of, uh, of bankruptcy. It's almost like money control the US government. Well, we saw this in your lifetime. After the financial panic in 2008, and the banks did unbelievably risky and so illegal or at least corrupt by any measure moves, what happened to them? They got bailed out and got a lot of money. And what did they learn from this? Nothing. Keep doing it. Actually, they learned something really important. Keep doing it. Because we'll never, they'll never allow us to go, go on. Free market. Well, it, it's remember when I told you about government and why business gets into it? The rules. Who writes the rules? And they write it for themselves. I guess, would we write it for ourselves? No, because we're good people. We'd write it for the best, better of everybody. But there's people out there that won't. Okay, maybe some of us might write it. <laughs> But is this, this is a big example. By the way, isn't this a clever cartoon? It's implying that Teddy Roosevelt is protecting the Dominican Republic from European creditors. Yet virtually all the creditors were US banks. Yeah, that's a, it's a good cartoon, isn't it? So that's big sick diplomacy. As we know it's in economic imperialism, but for whom? Well, we saw banks would be the big one to go in and bail out the creditors. And this is going to happen time after time after time after time after time after time after time. time. Where the United States would go in and sometimes literally overthrow governments, overthrow them, put in a government that will suck the money out to go to creditors. And boy, do they find out what a great way to control. If you get someone into debt, if I am your creditor and you're in debt to me, I kind of own you. Because if you miss one payment, I got you. I got you. Unless you owe me like three or four billion dollars, then maybe you got me because I really need the money back. That's another story. But who else? A lot of corporations, mining interests, timber interests, a lot of copper interests, but the biggest was United Fruit. United Fruit, as you can tell from this picture, were big producers of, can you guess? Could it be anything? Hmm. What? Oranges. Yeah, it's obviously oranges, uh, some sugar beets, peaches. I would peach actually sounds really good. Or a tangerine. So here's a banana harvest. I like this one. They're kind of kind of selling it as a, you can take a trip on the banana boat. And United Fruit would become the dominant company in Latin America. They would soon own the majority of arable land in the isthmus of Central America. And so therefore, they just suck the money out. And bananas are perfect for export because you can pick them green and they can last on a boat for a month, two months and still be delicious. I gotta admit, I love bananas. I eat a banana every day. Yeah. What's the, there's a song called Banana Boat. Yeah, the Banana That's, Boat, yeah. Okay. In fact, have you ever heard the country, uh, the name, neighbor a country called the Banana Republic. 
and they named a store after but Banana Republic. It's not because they produce the bananas. It's because the banana company runs the country. And there's, there's going to be all kinds of pictures of United Fruit represented like an octopus. Remember those pictures of an octopus I showed you of Standard Oil? The same kind of thing. They run the government. They buy off the government. They buy off officials. And whenever they're in trouble, they call in the U.S. government. And they market their bananas under the name Chiquita. So if you see Chiquita bananas, it's United Fruit. And they became so powerful that by the 1980s, they would have a banana-shaped satellite orbiting the Earth, beaming banana-related propaganda to us 24 hours a day. <laughs> okay, I got it. That would be fun. I got to give them that. Come on, think about it. The big banana floating around. You can see it across the sky in a clear night. <laughs> Your generation grew up eating different kind of banana than ours. Hmm? I read an article sometime. Yeah, it was square. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I don't know. I really don't. I'm sure there's been hybrids and differences, but, but I don't remember any big differences. Huh? Huh? Yeah, yes, I was fine. And you guys have a In my day! We had square bananas, and most of it was uphill. Okay. <laughs> so they ran everything, United Fruit. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I really can't think of anything. I'll pull it, I'll pull it up after, after class, because I, I swear I ran the If you find it, let me know. Okay. I don't remember any difference in taste. It, you, it's easier to get bananas now year-round. Okay. When I was your, well, yeah, when I was your age, it was still seasonal, which, uh, um, I got to admit, it's really nice getting back. <laughs> and about government, how do they feel about democracy, the U.S.? They're not big fans. No. The reason is simple. If there's a democracy in these countries, they'll do things like force United Fruit to sell their land and give it to peasants. They'll kick out or sign new trade agreements. What do they want? The U.S. wants dictatorships. Dictatorships will make sure that the bananas flow, or the copper, or the credit, or whatever it might be. And this is a problem for so many, so many reasons. But there's a, um, you'll see a lot of resentment in Central America, Latin America, against the United States, because the United States is going to promote some horrific dictatorships, especially in places like Nicaragua or Cuba or Guatemala. Heck, the United States tries to overthrow governments now. Just try to do one in Venezuela and a couple years ago in Bolivia. Right? There's so many things going on. I know it's hard to keep track of everything, but yeah, that's right now. Well, not right now, but that was... Heck, Venezuela twice, one under Bush and one under Trump. President Bush, President Trump. Venezuela has a lot of problems, but... Okay, so... These are just in the up to the 20s, and these dates are just when U.S. troops were sent. And you might think, first off, that's a lot. But secondly, there was not a lot of direct military intervention in Honduras, but there was a lot of sailing ships on the shore saying, you better do what we want. Now, the U.S. justified it by saying these governments are corrupt and a lot were, and a lot of problems. But there's an underlying issue to that, too. And... This will set the precedent. After World War II, we'll start taking this into the other hemisphere. And this will have massive problems for the United States to this day in the Middle East, where the U.S. is going to support unbelievably bad dictators. Heck, one dictator will support and then turn around and invade Iraq. So this has got lots of problems down the road. And so with that, Nicaragua is a classic example. Bananas and banks. And the Marines are going to be sent time after time after time. Pure Marines in Managua, the capital. And I love this picture. First off, they got them with a jar of the writing pants on. I, I, I don't know why I like that picture. Um, that was the Marines wore that hat up until World War, beginning of World War II. That was still the regulation hat. Um, it turned out to be kind of, it didn't work. It was probably. It, like it does, yeah. 
Well, forest rangers were based upon, you know, but you know what's why? Yeah, they're not holding they thought pirates are cool or something. They're making a statement. They're calling themselves pirates because they know exactly what they're doing. They're going in, taking out the government, sucking the money out. They know it. This is not just we thought the flag was cool or yeah. Which is you think they're not allowed. If you're in the armed forces, you can't make political statements. You're not supposed to. I know they do, but you're not supposed to. So they're doing it indirectly. And so that actually has big meaning. General Smedley Butler would be the most decorated soldier in American history before World War II. And he would, most of his awards came in big sick diplomacy. And he wrote a book called I Was a Gangster for the Youth for Wall Street Pets. So they knew what they were doing. Yes, the U.S. did some things like help build roads, but there's, it's, it's complicated. Yes. What was his name again? Smedley Butler. Yes, his name was Smedley. And yes, if everything goes right, we will watch something with Smedley. Smedley would become, an, when some of the richest Americans in the United States tried to overthrow uh, President Roosevelt and replace it with a fascist dictator, they tried to get Butler to do it. But they found out Butler hated him. So here's another classic example, the Panama Canal. So the canal, would also, Roosevelt a lot, a lot of times called this a feather in his cap. Well, they've been talking about it, uh, building a canal between the isthmus of, over the isthmus of Central America since uh, the 17th century. And up through the 19th century, they're thinking Nicaragua. Uh, there's a lot of lakes there so that they just connect the lakes. It turned out to be just too daunting of a task. But Panama is narrow, but it's got a high mountain spine, so a very high divide in the middle. So they'd have to cut through that. And the French have tried. The same company that, um, it was a partnership to build the Suez, so the French side was trying here. But they couldn't, they didn't get very far. It's just too daunting. And the technology in the 1890s wasn't quite there. It, it improved a lot in just 15 years. Panama was part of Colombia. So the U.S. is negotiating now with Colombia. The Spanish-American War seemed to really show this was necessary. I put this up because half of the U.S. fleet was here. And when the war began, they said they had to bring the fleet all the way around South America. And the realization hit if we needed it immediately, that would take over twice as long. So it became also an issue for defense, not just trade. And so Roosevelt, Remember, Under Secretary of the Navy, he kind of had that for both. They begin to negotiate with Panama. I should add one thing real fast. The French Canal didn't work, but Philippe Bonal Varilla. Varilla. Yeah, I always want to add an L there, but it's in Spanish, they have double L silent. And so it's, I always, it's hard for an English speaker to do that. Unless you're very good at Spanish, I'm not very good. I try, I'm trying now. But he had been negotiating for the French, didn't work, and he's still there. And so he's kind of trying to intrigue to get a piece of the canal because he knows he can get rich. He's trying to get Colombia to do it. So the United States makes an offer to Colombia. 10 million, give us the canal. Colombia realizes, no, this is robbery, and they turn it down. Why it's, the Colombian legislature realizes that the United States, if they get the canal for only $10 million, they'll make that back many times over, charging fees to go through the canal. So this is blatant robbery. Colombia wants a piece of the canal. The U.S. says, no, we'll give you the money and we take the land. So this is not a good deal for Colombia. They knew it wasn't a good deal. But. Then all of a sudden, a revolution happened in Panama. Just a second. Oh, I forgot to do something. A revolution. Just give me a second.
Sorry about that. All right, so there's a revolution. And Panama wanted independence. A revolution, you know, this is a cause. Now, there's no roads that connect Bogota to Panama City. It's such a rugged jungle. So everything has to go by sea. And the revolution began. And guess who just happened to be off the shore of both sides of the isthmus to make sure Colombia could not send reinforcements to stop the rebellion? The U.S. Navy had sent naval squadrons to make sure Colombia couldn't stop it. So the U.S. directly aided the revolution. Now the U.S. denied this, but the Navy, not the Navy being there, allowed for the rebels to take over Panama City and declare an independent country. Roosevelt would always say, "I had nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with this." So the Navy just. Side. Just this happened to be there. As a human, they call it a humanitarian mission. But we would find out later that the Roosevelt, Roosevelt State Department, Secretary, Secretary of State John Hay, who was in on it, he wired down to Panama City to congratulate the freedom fighters for overthrowing Colombia two days before the rebellion began. They got the dates wrong. It could happen to anybody. So they had no idea, they just were in advance. So the U.S. helped overthrow. Panama is now independent. Guess what Panama gave? And by the way, Secretary of State John Hay would make a joke about we don't want any taint of legality to, uh, to hamper uh, Roosevelt's taking of Panama. Oh, good cartoon then. TR, gun, little Panama. The United States and the new country of Panama would sign the Hay Bonaberia Treaty. Gee, now Bonaberia, Bonaberia, sorry, is now the Secretary of or the Foreign Minister for the brand new Republic of Panama. And they signed away the treaty for $10 million and $250,000 a year. So basically the same agreement that Colombia got. They would later double this. And so here is. New Panama, TR digging the canal, dumping the dirt on Bogota. But when they started digging there in 1904, it was a disaster, an absolute disaster. The men died of yellow fever and malaria. They didn't know how the technology to, to cut through these massive mountains. And to make the canal locks was beyond, uh, beyond anybody's ability up to that time. They basically had to create this all on their own. Well, the United States Army Corps of Engineers finally sent an engineer fresh from uh, flood control duty in the Northwest or the Northeast, General William Gottholz. And Gottholz from the Corps of Engineers was the one to organize the engineering, organize the, um, the blast crews, the digging crews, and these brand new steam shovels, and used a lot of Panamanian labor because of the disease. So many of the people in the U.S. came down were just devastated by yellow fever and mosquitoes or uh, malaria. And the same thing was happening in Havana. Two doctors, one in Havana, one in Panama, they at, at the same time, but it directly dealt with the Panama Canal, realized what was causing yellow fever and malaria, what was spreading it. They didn't know. And as we all know, it's swamp gas. If you get rid of mosquitoes, or can at least limit them, get rid of standing water where the larva is, it reduces dramatically the effects of yellow fever. And so they begin to get rid of the like standing water and get rid of swamps and things like that. I'll tell you how they do it in a second. It's not pretty. But that's why the US Army Hospital in Washington, DC is called Walter Reed. And so with that, 
Here's Roosevelt, he came, went down there. He'd be the first sitting president of the United States to leave the borders of the continental US. Now, they made it very carefully that he always was on board ships, so he just went to the canal zone, which was technically US territory, still. And here's where the divide was. And if you, I've never been on this. I know people have gone on a cruise. I don't like, I'm not a cruise guy, so I won't ever go on a cruise, but I would like to go on boats. I would love to go through the canal. And I've talked to people who do it, and it just sounds just amazing. Has anyone done that or know anybody who did that? Yeah. I, yeah, I've noticed I have to go on a cruise. So most people I know are on like the cruise that does it, but I know you can take another boat to do it. Some people love cruises. When things get back to normal, they go on cruises. I'm implying things will get back to normal. Normal-ish. That's just normal. But here's uh, Gottles. <laughs> And that's just how they got rid of the mosquitoes. They're dumping oil on any kind of standing water. It'll suffocate everything inside. So it's horrible. I, I know. But the canal would be built. And it's one of the great wonders of the world. They are just finished constructing a wider canal for the new super carriers, uh, uh, super uh, container ships, super tankers. And... <laughs> It's still relatively narrow, the original canal. So US Navy ships had to fit in it. So here's the battleship USS North Carolina in World War II, a 47,000 ton battleship. And look how tight it is. But eventually the ships got bigger and so they couldn't use the canal anymore. So like the big super carriers now can't go through the canal. They'll go through the new one. So with that, Taft would be the next president. And Taft, Breathing through a mask gets your throat so dry. Have you guys noticed that? Wow. That looks like a lot more recent for the political. What's that? That political picture looks a lot more recent. Yeah, that is more recent. I just I couldn't find a good one, and I found this one that someone made up kind of looking back at it. I thought, that's ah, close enough. And what it was is it still used the big stick, but it promoted more. No, no, we're going to help them. It's really pro-business, and they want stability. If you're always sitting in the Marines, it's not stable. He'd still do it. Don't get me wrong. But the big thing is they got those countries into debt. You get them into debt, and then you control them by saying, we'll help you get out of debt if you do what we want. And here's the deal. If they get that much debt, they might reduce the payments, but stretch it out for longer, meaning are they ever out of debt? It's kind of like sharecroppers. Remember sharecroppers? It's kind of the same kind of thing that's going to happen a lot in America. And so with that, let me get to one more thing really quick. While this is going on, there's massive imperialism in Asia. The Dutch had this colony, Britain, France. We might have a little issue here called Vietnam. By the way, this Dutch colony would be the trigger of World War II. Now the U.S. is here. Japan defeated China and taken Korea and Formosa, which is today we call Taiwan. And Russia has taken Manchuria. And everybody's trying to scoop up China. Britain, France, and the United States in the periphery helped defeated China in two wars to force China to make all these treaties to let foreign trade in. You know the name of these wars? Those are the opium wars, yeah. They found something that the Chinese couldn't keep out, an addictive drug. Don't forget, though, Jamestown, an addictive drug. There's a lot of that in history. So there's China. So the United States has this relationship with China. Remember, there's a lot of immigrants, mines. This kind of review. Remember, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. So this stuff we've talked about before. And look how racist these pictures are, the exclusion fence. And the illusion of a wall to keep out immigrants, this goes back to the 1890s. So this was a big deal in your lifetime, the election of 2016. President Trump used it to great effect to really rise up nativist, anti-immigrant feeling. Well, it was used in 1890s. So he didn't make it up. You know, this has been used a lot. We're gonna keep all of the all of the others out of our paradise. But in 1900, the Boxer Rebellion happened in China. 
And the Botcher Rebellion was due to a couple things. As I mentioned before, this is economic imperialism. The, the great powers forced China to sign all of them. They literally called them unequal treaties. Just to take, to just exploit China. And they occupied them with troops in big cities. They carved out areas of cities for trading enclaves. They even, but they even talk colonies, but to colonize a massive country like China would be really expensive. Even though countries are thinking it. Also, there's a lot of missionary activity. And there was a lot of anger in China over Protestant missionaries telling Chinese that they're all going to go to hell for not believing in Christianity. There was a lot of prejudice involved. Don't forget, this was the most racist time in history. And so there were a lot of missionaries who went over there that did amazing work, and there were a lot that really angered the Chinese. By the way, that's where the British discovered martial arts clubs. And that's where the center of the rebellion would begin. A society of the righteous and harmonious fists. But the British didn't know what it was. So what did they call these people who were fighting? Boxer. So, watch that video. Let me know if there's any problems with it, but I think you'll really like it. You know what I mean by like it. You're going to go, wow, that's well done. It's a, it's a really unbelievable story. Some of you, you, you know the basics already. We did a lot of that in, let's see, seventh grade, I think. Seventh grade. Seventh grade. Seventh grade. Seventh grade. Oh, good. Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect period that, you know, because you can really see it there. Yeah. Right, have a good weekend. Clear out of here. I think when I uh, open up the tab to look at it, I think my, there will be like a spark in my eyes and I hope you like it though. I did. It was pretty interesting. Though. Oh, so you didn't watch it? Yeah. Plus, uh, well, so like he said, we went over the trial or triangle waste uh -huh. factory in seventh grade. Uh, but it's kind of like a number thing. It's kind of just cool to see you know, like how far you can go and how bad it can get. It's amazing what people do for a buck. I just thought it was disgusting reading about people calling bats in the jungle. I'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But I want to make sure you guys have it all read so we just, you already knew those stories. Okay, so I got my time frame a little bit off. I just read the art, uh, an article and it said that um, the gross, the, um, Oh, bananas, okay. The gross Mitchell banana went extinct in the 1950s, and that was the most popular banana at that time. Oh, well, I so didn't I know that, it, okay. I guess it'd be like my grandparents. So like, that was the banana they ate, and the banana we eat now is like completely different. I wonder how it was different. I don't know, but I guess we'll, I, I think it's probably like taste, but we'll never know, because we, we've never tasted them. Get so it went extinct. Did it say why it went extinct? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was because of some of this stuff, like over uh, overgrowth, and I think a, a fungus. Yeah, we eat yeah. overgrowth. The fungus will spread like wildfire. Fusarium so wilt or Panama disease. It just like collapsed the banana. I have no idea. I have to look at that. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. We know. yeah of course. That's See, Chris says I like bananas so much. We talked bananas today. I was gonna ask. I use another question.